All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So tonight, we are, we're going to look at a new sutta. We are still going to be looking in the connected discourses, the Samyutta Nikaya, but we're going to move to a new section tonight. So we're going to move to the section called the Sad Ayatana Samyutta, or the Sal Ayatana in Pali. So this is the section about sutras and the connection. They all have to do with the Sad Ayatana, the six sense bases. So the six senses. So, and the particular sutta that we're going to look at tonight is called the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, the famous fire sermon. So let me tell you a little bit about this sutta before we kind of even read about it. So this sutta is a very important, famous sutra. I'll tell you, I first uh, learned about this sutra a long time ago. In fact, this probably, like in many ways, realistically, this was probably the first sutra I ever read. And I say that because you might be familiar with this book called What the Buddha Taught by Walpola Rahula. It's a very, it's, I think, 1969, I want to say. It's old, 59. So originally written in 1959, this is a, you know, it was a, it is, and it was a very popular book, an introduction to Buddhism, what the Buddha taught. And in this book, in the back of it, I believe these are translated by Walpala Rahula, but in the back, there are translations of a few different sut suttas, and one of them is the fire sermon. And even though this is not the first sutra, ah, it's the second sutra in, in the book. The first sutra is, of course, the Buddha's first teaching the turning the dharma wheel sutra and you know i probably you know i can't remember i probably read the first sutra but i remember you know i got this book i want to say it was like i was a freshman in college so this was like my my one of my first introductions to buddhism was this book and I remember that oh so many years ago, I was particularly interested in the fire sutra or the fire sermon as it's called. So this particular sutra kind of is, was important to me because it was sort of one of the sutras that really, you know, sort of turned me on to Buddhism, you might say. So I'm excited to kind of revisit it here so many years later. But there's another reason why this is a really important sutra. So you might not be aware. So let me tell you, there are three sutras or suttas that are considered the Buddha's first, second, and third teaching. If you really get into it, there is a chronology of the Buddha's teachings that sort of try to piece together, you know, the fourth sutra, the fifth sutra, the sixth, and so on. But the first three sutras are often kind of spoken about as a group, as like the first three sutras. And I think it's interesting to think about these so the first sutta, the first teaching of the Buddha is called this uh, Dharma Chakra Parivartana Sutta, the Turning the Dharma Wheel Sutra. Now, if you don't know your 
life story of the Buddha, it's kind of nice to know that, you know, the Buddha had been studying or meditating or practicing before he was awakened. He was practicing with these five ascetics, these five practitioners. And then he went off, became enlightened, sort of all on his own, and then came back. And the first teaching that he gave, this turning the Dharma wheel sutta, it was given to those same five ascetics that he had previously been kind of studying with. So he kind of came back to the group that he had been with, with his revelation, with his new information in that way. And so the first teaching of the Buddha is about the Four Noble Truths. And this was the teaching that is in this, you know, the tiny little, oh, by the way, the first teaching of the Buddha is in this same Samyutta Nikaya, but it's way in the back. If you have this copy, it's on page 1843. So that suit, the first sutra is way in the back in that section. It's in the Mahavaga section, the great book. And so that, of course, is the Buddha teaching these five ascetics the noble truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, the alleviation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And just to put it super simply, like super simply, the Buddha or Siddhartha, along with his five ascetic friends, they were all searching for moksha, as it would be called, like liberation. So they were out in the woods meditating they were out in the woods doing what we would call yoga. And the idea was, is that they were dissatisfied with the suffering of the world. And so they were looking for escape. They were looking for bliss. They were looking for this release. And so when the Buddha became enlightened, he came back to the five ascetics and his message, it's all suffering. <laughs> hey guys, we're not going to find it over there. <laughs> it's all suffering. That's the big noble truth that the Buddha drops on these five ascetics who were convinced that happiness, real happiness had to be around here somewhere. <laughs> And so the Buddha's teaching was, nope, I've realized it's all dukkha, it's all suffering. So that was the first teaching that the Buddha gave. Now, we haven't talked about the second sutra. If you're curious, the second sutra is also in this collection. It's on page 901. And this sutra, and I'm a little, I, I should have done this before, although we kind of basically did it. The second teaching of the Buddha is called the Anatman Lakshana Sutra, or the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the characteristic of no self. So again, that's, um, oh, you will find that sutra in the skandha section. So we just finished going through the skandha section. That was what we were doing for uh, many weeks, actually, was looking at suttas related to the skandhas. And I can tell you the really simple version of this. So this no, the second sutra is, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Buddha was in Varanasi in the Deer Park. There, the Blessed One addressed the group of five ascetics. So the same five ascetics as the first sutta, same for the second sutta. And the Buddha says, bhikkhus, 
Venerable sir, they reply. And the Buddha says this, bhikkhus, form is not self. <laughs> For if bhikkhus form were self, this form would not lead to affliction. And it would be possible to have it be, let my form be like this. And it would be like that. <laughs> but because form is not self, form leads to affliction. And it is not possible to have your form just be the way you want it. <laughs> Sensations are not the self. <laughs> Perception is not the self. Conditioning is not the self. Consciousness is not the self. For bhikkhus, if consciousness were self, this consciousness wouldn't lead to such affliction, and it would be possible for you to say, let my consciousness be this, and it would be that. <laughs> but because none of that is true of the five aggregates, the five aggregates are not self. So this is, you know, the main teaching that we've been talking about in weeks past, this not identifying with or as the five aggregates, this teaching of no self. That was the Buddha's second teaching. So the first teaching was everything is suffering, the Four Noble Truths. The second teaching is about no self. And now we come to the third teaching of the Buddha which is our fire sermon. So let me tell you the backstory about this. This is a really interesting backstory. And if you don't know this backstory, it's kind of an important part of the history of Buddhism. By the way, I highly recommend this book as well. It's called The Life of the Buddha by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli. And what this is, is it's basically a biography of the teaching career. Actually, I think it even begins with like the Buddha's birth, but it goes all the way to his, the Parinirvana, to the Buddha's death. And it basically narrativizes the bullet points of the life story of the Buddha, but it's all based upon either suttas or the Vinaya, or commentary. So it's a really interesting book. And so everything that I'm about to tell you, you can definitely find in this book. But what it is, is, is that, so the Buddha becomes awakened. He goes back to the Deer Park and he teaches the five ascetics about the Four Noble Truths and about the teaching of no self. Then, the Buddha went and visited a, a fire worshiper, all right? And this is what would be called a, I think it would be in here. Yeah, they just, they're called matted hair ascetics. And really quickly, I actually hadn't planned this. Hold on one sec. So I really like this book. This book's called Sadhus. These are not Buddhist, by the way. This is India's mystical holy men. But you'd have somebody that looks, let's see. Should have prepared this, sorry. I'm trying to find... Well, so this would be probably a very good example of a matted hair, fire-worshipping ascetic. <laughs> All right? So when they say matted hair, they mean dreadlocks, right? So the long, unkempt, unkempt hair. 
And these are, well, they're, they're called fire worshipers. And what we know of them is that they would do a fire ritual, what you might know of as a puja. They would do a puja fire ritual in the mornings and in the evenings. That was like a, a big part of this practice. Now, they were also ascetics, and that means that they were doing austerities, so things like fasting, various kind of disciplines of the body in various ways. So we need to kind of have this visual image that the Buddha goes and visits this, actually he goes and visits three matted haired ascetics who are performing this fire ritual or they're, they are fire worshipers. And he goes to the, the eldest of these three. And by the way, all three of these fire worshipers, they all have the same name, Kashapya or Kashapa. And there's like Kashapya of the river, Kashapya of some other place, and then like Kashapya sort of the senior. I think his name is Ur Uruvela or something like that. The senior Kashapa has 500 students. The next Kashapya has 300 students. And the next youngest Kashapya has 200 students. So together, there's a thousand students with the three Kashapyas. The Buddha goes and asks the senior of the Kashapyas, uh, Kashapya Uravela, can I stay in your fire hut tonight? And Kashapya Uravela says, yeah, you can stay there. But there's a naga, there's a serpent that's living in there. And so you're going to have to deal with that naga if you want to stay in the fire hut. And the Buddha basically goes in and the naga goes like running out. And Kashapya, the elder, is impressed by this. But he does this thing where he says, but even though he can, he is so powerful that he defeated the Naga, he's not an Arahat like me. That's This is what Kashapya the Uravela says. He, yeah, he's a mighty, a, a mighty uh, practitioner, but he's not a, a worthy one like me. Then all, basically the Buddha starts to perform all of these miracles. And at every time the Buddha performs one of these miracles, the Kashapya says, yeah, he's, he's powerful, but he's not a worthy one like me. And so it's kind of this story of the Buddha eventually converting Kashapya the elder with his 500 students. I won't tell you the whole long story about how that happens, but what, ha what happens is, is that when Kashapya the elder kind of basically accepts the Buddha as his teacher, he shaves off all his hair and basically he gets all of his fire worshiping gear and he takes his hair that he's cut off and he throws it in the river. His hair and all of his uh, fire worshiping stuff float down river where the other Kashapyas see it and they get worried. And they're like, oh my gosh, what happened to our the elder Kashapya? So they go ru rushing up the river only to find the elder Kashapya with shaved head at the, at the feet of the Buddha. And basically Kashapya is like, yeah, I converted. He's my teacher now. And they're like, should we convert? <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah. And so the, the, the story is, is that the other two Kashapyas 
kind of become students of the Buddha, shave their heads, and they give up their fire worshiping ways in that sense. So that's the sort of the background story of how the Buddha got his first thousand students. Technically, I guess it's a thousand and three because of the Kashapyas. And I guess we're to understand that the five ascetics were also there. So it's a thousand and eight, I suppose. But that's at this point. So in terms of the sutra that we're reading tonight, that's what stage of the Buddha's kind of um, life we're in. Okay. All right. So I think that's all I have. Ah, I do have one important thing to mention about the title of this sutra. So this actually took me a while. I've, it's one of those things where this particular sutra, well, in this book and other places, it's often called the fire sermon or the fire teaching. And what it is, is that this particular sutra is called the Adita Paryaya Sutta. Adita and actually just the word ditta, which is related to the word like dipta, which means like a, a lamp or a flame. Adita means on fire, burning. But this is the Adita Pariyaya Sutta. And that second word, Pariyaya, it's a really interesting word. It basically does mean like a teaching. So this is the fire teaching, but it, there's a little bit more to the term pariyaya. It is sort of like um, you could, if you if you really wanted to, you could go all as far as like revelation. It's like this idea of like, it's a very interesting word, Pariyaya. But what I want you to know is, is this, this particular word, it's not a part of every sutra, but there are some sutras that are Pariyayas. And there's just this kind of extra emphasis on the, um, on the, I guess I would put it as like the converting aspect of the teaching and by conversion i mean like giving up your fire worshiping ways and coming over to be a student of the buddha so a pariyaya kind of is about people hearing it and then converting to buddhism whereas if it's just a, a normal teaching of the buddha like a sutra that is being given to people who have already converted, it wouldn't necessarily be a pariyaya. Everybody good with that? Now, the reason why I wanted to tell you this is this. This, um, this word pariyaya, when all of these teachings, all of these sutras, when they start getting translated into the Chinese language, that word pariyaya is translated this way. So the Chinese term is a fa man, and a fa man is a dharma door. So the term Dharma door, which is what I call this Sunday night class, eventually the term in Chinese, Pariyaya, becomes a Fa Man, and a Fa Man is a Dharma door, and eventually kind of any teaching of the Buddha 
is a dharma door or a or a dharma gateway in that sense so i just wanted to make the little connection with sunday night dharma doors and the pariyaya so okay so that's all mostly all the background needed for this sutra any questions so far comments or ideas ready to dive in cool so here we go so again this is going to be samyutta nikaya section 35 sutta number 28 the aditya pariyaya sutta what they translate as just burning on one occasion the blessed one the buddha was dwelling at gaya at gaya's head together with a thousand bhikkhus there the blessed one addressed the thousand bhikkhus thus bhikkhus all is burning and what bhikkhus is the all that is burning the eye is burning visible forms are burning eye consciousness is burning eye contact is burning and whatever sensation arises with eye contact as a condition whether pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful that too is burning burning with what burning with the fire of raga desire or attraction or lust burning with the fire of hatred burning with the fire of delusion burning with birth aging and death burning with sorrow lamentation pain displeasure and despair i say the ear is burning sounds are burning ear consciousness is burning ear contact is burning and whatever sensation arises with ear contact as a condition whether pleasant painful or neither pleasant nor painful that too is burning the nose is burning, the tongue is burning, the body is burning, and the mind is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of desire, burning with the fire of hatred, burning with the fire of delusion. Burning with birth, burning with aging, burning with death. Burning with sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, I say. Let's pause there. <laughs> so the overall message of this sutra should not be a surprise in that way, but I want to kind of go through it in detail. So the first thing to note about this sutta, this sutra, the Aditya Pariyaya Sutra, the burning, it's actually part of a group of sutras and if we go back if you happen to have the this version if you go back a couple pages we arrive at the first little sutta in this collection and this collection i think there's let's see yeah there's 10 10 little sutras or suttas that are part of this collection and this collection is called Saba, or in Sanskrit, Sarva, the all. Now that word, Sarva, all, the, the everything, the all, that is the word at the beginning of the sutra that we're reading tonight, the burning, the, the fire sutra. When the Buddha says all 
is burning. And what bhikkhus is the all? Well, that's where we got to go back to the first of the suttas. So at Shravasti, I'm, I'm reading the first sutta in this section, by the way. At Shravasti, the Buddha said this. Bhikkhus, I will teach you the all. And what bhikkhus is the all? The eye and visible forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and tastes, the body and tactile objects, the mind and mental phenomena. This is called the all. If any, if anyone bhikkhus should speak thus, having rejected this all, I shall make known another all. That would be a mere empty boast on that person's part. If that person were questioned, they would not be able to reply and further, they would meet with vexation. And for what reason? Because bhikkhus, that would not be within this domain. So this is an important kind of aspect of Buddhism. It, it's what, in, in my opinion, it's what makes Buddhism like a very advanced teaching for being so old. So the Buddha is talking about the all, the everything. And he's saying that the totality of existence is bounded by the sensory organs and their respective sensory objects. And that's it. And if anybody were to say that there's something kind of outside of that domain, they would just be boasting, the Buddha says. So in other words, the Buddha, if this is the way that I interpret that teaching of the all, I understand that as the Buddha saying, we could talk about some other realm and we could talk about some other place, but if you've never had any actual experience of that, it is just idle chatter in that way. So this idea that there is something outside of the existential experience, that's what the Buddha is saying. No, the all is what constitutes your existential experience via eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain, and the respective sensory objects of those organs. This is kind of a really kind of important aspect of Buddhism. It's kind of a very, um, oh, I guess you could, you could start applying kind of more modern philosophical terms to this in terms of like pragmatism or realism. There's a lot of kind of terms, but this is a kind of advanced way of looking or thinking in that way, that the limit of the knowable is sensory experience in that way. Now, the first sutra that I just read, it defines the all as the six sensory organs and their respective objects. By the time we get around to our burning, to our Aditya Pariyaya Sutta, the Buddha defines the all as the sensory organ the sensory object, and the sense consciousness that arises upon their contact. And so that, if you haven't heard the expression, that is what is known as the 18 realms. The six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the six sense consciousnesses that arise upon their contact that makes 18, 18 factors or 18 dharmas that constitute 
reality in that sense. Now, one of the things to keep in mind as we move through this sutta, we need to keep in mind that for Buddhism, what is being called consciousness, sense consciousness, we need to understand that that particular idea of a vijnana, it's kind of important to understand that that is always understood as an, an, an emergent phenomena. And by emergent phenomena, what we mean is, is that it kind of doesn't exactly exist. It's emergent, but what the idea here is, is that there's a sense organ and there's a sense object, an eyeball and a visible form. When the two are in contact, there emerges a visual awareness. But that visual awareness is not in the eyeball, nor is it in the visible object. It is sort of neither here nor there. It's an emergent phenomena. And the most important thing to, to remember is that when the contact between the sense organ and the sense object, when the contact is severed, the consciousness just isn't anymore. The conditions for there to be that are no longer present. I'm really quickly, we have lots of time. So let me let me give you an example of this. Many of you have seen this before, but if you haven't seen this, it's important to think about. So I'm going to show you this. And the idea here is, is that if you're looking at the screen right now and you can see my record, then there is your eyeball and the visible form of the circular black and green record. And if you can see it, there is a visual awareness. It's this kind of idea of an eye consciousness that is arising right now because you can, you if you can see it, because there's contact. But watch what happens when I sever the contact. You can't see it anymore. It that particular visual awareness is is gone. The, the contact is severed and I could reestablish contact. And now there is this visual awareness of the record again. So we've got visual or sense organ, sense object, and then this kind of visual awareness. There's also sound. And right now, if you can hear my voice, then there is contact between the sound of my voice and your ear. And then there is auditory awareness arising. But if I come over here and but if I hit the button, contact means you can hear me now and it's arising. So contact, awareness, no contact, there's just no awareness. So that's for the eye, the ear, and sound, the nose with odors, the tongue, and the body touching things. The one interesting thing that's different, or the one thing that makes Buddhism kind of different, Buddhism treats the brain as a sensory organ. Not unlike the eyes, not unlike the ear, the thing about the brain, though, it has a different sensory object. And what I mean is, is that eyes correspond to visible form. Ears correspond to sounds. 
the brain corresponds to what are called dharmas. Mental objects is a translation. What did our sutra call it? I think our sutra called it, I'm not sure. We'll find it in a second. But it's this idea of a mind object. So here's the interesting thing about the brain. Remember my record? If you can remember my record, remember it was black with the green label and it was circular, right? If right now you can remember the record, that's your brain being in contact with the sense impression of the record. Meaning if right now, like you can kind of visualize the record, that's your brain being in contact with that idea. Just like as if you were seeing it with your eyes because there's contact, thinking about something means that your brain is in contact with that idea. And when you're thinking about something, that's what that is your brain being in contact with that idea. And the point is, is that if I started throwing a bunch of new ideas at you right now, and I kind oh, let's go back and talk about the sutra, and what about this, and what about that? As your mind stops thinking about my record, it just means that that dharma, the sense impression of the record, is no longer in contact with your brain. And now you're in contact with whatever it is you're thinking about right now. The interesting thing about this, and I mention this a lot when I teach the six senses and the six consciousnesses, what this means though, is that from a Buddhist point of view, the brain is not the generator of ideas. The brain senses ideas. It doesn't make them. It senses them. And that's a really different way of thinking about consciousness, not as an active generator of ideas, but a much more passive experiencer of ideas. It's a very different way of thinking about mental activity and there's a way in which if you think of mental activity as a, like that you're doing it, there can be a kind of, um, well, a kind of frustration with that, <laughs> especially when we have obtrusive thoughts that we can't get rid of. And we're like, wait a minute, why can't I shut this thing off? Well, because you're not running it to begin with. <laughs> it's there sensing things in that way. If you understand that, that the brain is a more passive sensor, then you can kind of give up trying to think of things and be more observing of the thoughts happening in that way. So, okay, so that's a quick kind of breakdown of the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and then the emerging, temporary, emerging six consciousnesses. The Buddha is telling Kashapya and Kashapya and Kashapya, the three Kashapyas, the Buddha is telling them that all of that is burning, right? So here's the thing about it. I think this is such an interesting sutra and I really haven't, I hadn't really looked at it this way until getting ready to teach this course or teach this class tonight. And what I didn't really realize is that I had always read because of my, you know, back in the day, I always read the fire sermon sutra as like, how can I put it? Well, as 
the Dharma as, as like the truth. And it is the truth. It is the Dharma. But what I didn't quite realize is this. The Buddha, in getting ready to teach these former fire worshipers, the Buddha seems to have come up with an upaya, a skillful means to teach this to these former fire worshipers. And what I mean is, these particular matted hair ascetics who were worshiping fire, for them, Agni, as it would be called, like the, the sacred fire, is like, you know, oh, that's Agni, that's fire, that's, you know, sacred there. Let's worship, let's worship Agni in the morning and in the evening. The Buddha seems to be saying to them, it's all fire. It's fire everywhere. <laughs> why, why kind of privilege this particular instance of fire when it's all on fire? It, it's all burning. Now, what I mean is, is this. If you, if you go and read the very next sutta, the very next sutra, which is called being weighed down. And there, the Buddha says this, bhikkhus, the all, all is weighed down. And what bhikkhus is the all that is so weighed down? The eyes are weighed down. The nose is weighed down. And so that's a different metaphor. Like to say that the eyes and the ears and the nose, to say that they're on fire, that's one way to put it. To say that they are bogged down or they are weighed down, that's another way to put it. And so my point is, is that I think it's really important to know that the Buddha was talking to a thousand former fire worshipers. And for them, he taught the Dharma by saying, fire worshipers, it's all on fire. And then, you know, maybe it was a bunch of weightlifters the next day. And he was like, it's all weighed down. It's all too heavy for us to lift, right? But my point is, is that I think it's really... It's a much more interesting sutra if you remember that he was talking to fire worshipers and thus telling them that it's all burning in that way. So, okay. Everybody doing okay? Oh, good. Okay. Um. Yeah, so... Let's, I guess we should talk about this. Let's. Yeah, let's, let's kind of, uh, let me go through the rest of the sutra and then we'll sort of approach it as a whole. So we go through, oh, and of course, if you're reading this kind of standard version, everything is um ellipses right where they only give us the formula for the eye right which is that the eye is burning burning with lust burning with hatred burning with delusion burning with birth all of that but then of course we should know the entire formula goes for the ear the nose the tongue the body and then the brain or the mind and now, seeing thus, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences viraga towards the eye. Viraga 
is being translated here as revulsion. But I'm going to have a few things to say about that term, revulsion. So the tech, the actual word is viraga. The instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion, dispassion, or viraga towards the eye, towards visible forms, towards eye consciousness, towards eye contact, towards whatever sensation arises with eye contact as a condition, whether pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. The instructed noble disciple experiences viraga towards the ear and sounds, towards the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, and towards whatever sensation arises with mind contact as a condition. Through, sorry, experiencing this revulsion, one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. And one understands. Destroyed is death. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. This is what the Blessed One said. Elated, those bhikkhus delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, the minds of those thousand bhikkhus were liberated from the taints by non-clinging. Okay. So, I suppose, like, one of the main things that I want to say is... All of this should sound very familiar, especially if you've been coming to Dharma doors recently, because we've been so focused on this idea of, quote, developing revulsion. Except before this, we were in the section about the skandhas. And what the Buddha was telling us is that in terms of the body of form, Sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness, the five aggregates, the instructed noble disciple develops revulsion towards the aggregates. Now, now that we're in the Sad Ayatana section, the section on the six senses, it's the exact same message, except now it's about developing revulsion towards the six senses. At the end of the day, the six senses and the five aggregates, it's the same idea. It's sort of just a matter of, um, there's like, obviously there's philosophical or dharmic differences between these two ideas. But ultimately, the first aggregate, the body of form, that is the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain. The idea of the six consciousnesses, that is the fifth aggregate. That is vijnana. It's just broken into six kinds of vijnana. So the one thing that this teaching of the all the one thing that that adds to the equation is the world of objects. Visible forms, sounds, smells, flavors, tactile objects, and dharmas or thoughts. Those are now part of the equation in terms of de developing revulsion. So in other words, when we were in the skanda section, we were strictly developing revulsion towards the five aggregates. In this section, we're developing revulsion towards all of it. What would be considered self 
and what would be considered other in that way. Now, before I go any further, I want to talk about this idea of revulsion. So let's get into the language here. We have a little bit of language work to do. So if you have the Wisdom Publication Edition, like Bhikkhu Bodhi, Bhikkhu Bodhi is an amazing translator, but his preferred term for raga is lust, like sexual craving, sexual lust. His translation of, of devesha is hatred. And then his translation of moha, I believe he does, is delusion. So as you know, or I hope you know, the three kleshas, the three afflictions, the three poisons are raga, devesha, and moha. But how do we how do we translate those things? Again, it could be lust, hatred, and delusion. But if you've been coming to Dharma doors, or if you've studied with me before, I'm the kind of teacher that I. I really appreciate, or I feel like I appreciate, that Buddhism has a broad vocabulary when it comes to psychology and emotions. And what I mean is that there's a lot of different words for things like desire, craving, wanting, lust. There's a few more I can think of, but there's a lot of different words that all kind of pertain to a kind of wanting or desiring. The way that I teach the three poisons, though, is that for me, what is called raga, raga is, for me, attraction, being attracted, whereas devesha, I consider devesha to be aversion. Now, the reason why I say this is because these three poisons, these three kleshas are considered the roots, the root causes of all other mental afflictions. And so the idea here is, is that there is the initial stirring. Again, what could be called attraction? The initial stirring of attraction can turn into tanha, craving. It can turn into sexual lust. It can turn into all of these things, but in its nation state, it is attraction. Similarly, devesha is just aversion, but that can turn into ill will, hatred, violence, all kinds of things. Similarly, moha, for me, moha is being confused. It's like, what's, what's going on here? That can turn into ignorance, delusion, like these really deeper kind of mental afflictions of not knowing what's going on. But it starts with a general state of cloudy confusion. That's moha. So I teach it that way, again, because I, at least as far as I understand Buddhism, Again, those three root causes turn into these other things. If we understand it that way, and I'm just, you know, that's just the way that I teach it. That's the way I think of it. But if you're with me on that, in particular, if you're with me on raga being attraction that turns into other things, the word... The Pali word, and I believe it's the same in Sanskrit, 
But the word that's being translated as revulsion and dispassion is viraga. So basically like anti-raga in that way. My point is, is that, well, actually, let me take one step back really quickly. Let's, for the sake of the text, for the sake of this particular sutra, let's use the example of um, sexual attraction. Like, let's be kind of classic Buddhist in that way, and let's kind of think about um, sexuality in that sense. What I kind of, the way that I would think about it is this. Let's say you're just sitting on a park bench. And let's say that you are very calm, very uh, tranquil in that sense. If somebody were to walk by <laughs> that you find attractive, that you find, you know, sexually attractive in that way, I want you to think about the stages of how that kind of arises. And what I mean by that is, is that the initial, like if somebody walked by, there would be the initial stirring of attraction. After the initial stirring of attraction, the mind could start kind of fantasizing about you know various ideas and then start craving and now we're talking about like being what you know what they would call being horny and like being lustful in that traditional use of the word lust but i want us to again i want us to look at how there is the initial stirring of attraction that then turns if if it if it goes unchecked turns into more visceral sexual desire. And it's the same for everything in that way, where it starts with a little bit of like, ooh, and then turns into craving in that sense. So let's look at it that way. And what I mean is, is this, I know that this, or sorry, I know that the Theravada Buddhist tradition and the more um, Hinayana, call it, type of Buddhism, I know that they are really into like identifying lust as like the particular problem in that way. And so they also, in the Hinayana, in the Theravada, they then also use this language of revulsion. And the way that it's taught, or at least, let me be careful, in some Theravada Buddhist traditions, it is taught as revulsion. I, and what I mean by that is, regarding the skandhas, regarding the body of form, there are some schools of Theravada style Buddhism that want you to be disgusted by your own body, like revulsed by it. I don't teach Buddhism that way at all. I think that that's a very, um, it, it's too dualistic. It's too sharp. There's just a lot of problems with that. But I think the problem is that it has to do with how you define this term viraga and what i mean is is that if you translate raga as lust then yeah viraga is some sort of like revulsion it's like anti-lust so that's some sort of like you know whatever but if we look at it sort of the way that i was talking about where raga is like the initial stirring or the initial stimulation. I want you to think about this. 
it, it, this is a difficult one because it's going to be very diff different for everybody. But I want you to think about something, not, not something that you don't like, but just something that like you don't care about one way or the other <laughs> that you are absolutely it's like you know let me let me just for the sake of conversation let me think of something whatever i don't i'm not really into soccer let's say just so happens that i don't i don't, one way or another right and so if i'm if I go to like a, I don't know, let's say I go to a restaurant and they have like TV on and there's a soccer game. I don't, I'm not, there's no raga. <laughs> there is no like, oh, I hope this team wins or there's no stimulation at all. There's just sort of this non raga towards it. That's what I think viraga is. It's, I don't understand, or I don't interpret it as revulsion. I interpret it as not having that initial stirring in that way. And what I want you to think about is, you know, let's just go back to be the example I gave of sitting on the park bench. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the park bench and a soccer ball <laughs> goes rolling by. There's no raga. And what my point is, is that that is not a revulsion towards soccer. There's just not raga. There's not that arising of, of desire or that stimulation to go get more in that way. So if we understand viraga that way, I find you can teach Buddhism in a very different way where it's not about this developing a kind of distaste for the world, but it's more sort of just not being so turned on by the world in that way. And that is how I do understand the Dharma. Like that's how I understand the teaching is that the basic idea is that we are all a little too excited about it all. And because we're all a little too excited about it all, we get disappointed very easily. And that's the ride of pleasure and pain in that way. So this particular teaching, this idea of seeing that the eyes are burning and visible forms are burning, seeing all of that bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences viraga towards the eye viraga towards visible forms and again i want you to feel the difference between having a revulsion towards those visible forms versus just not being attracted to them and then notice or if you can think about it think about how stable that is to not be attracted to this stuff one way or the other what that means is is those things of the world don't move us and that's a big part of buddhism or at least i think that it's a big part of buddhism it's the difference of like of having all of these things of the world move us and move us towards it or move us away from it. But the idea is, is that if you're like that, meaning if, if you are full of Raga, Devesha, and Moha, there's a way in which the world is working you. The world is just like, go over there. Ha ha. Now go over there. Ha ha. You know, and you're just sort of like, okay, okay. Whereas if you kind of have more self-control, as the Buddhists would say, but that idea of if you're not 
moved by the things of the world, you become immovable. You become what is known as akshobia, imperturbable. It's basically a superpower to not be moved by the world in that way. That's how I understand this particular teaching. And, you know, I think that there's something to be said, though, for contemplating the analogy or contemplating the upaya that the Buddha says that the eyes are on fire, visible forms are on fire, or that they are burning. I want to say something about that, that I guess analogy or metaphor of the burning of everything being on fire. There's a few more layers to that. So really quickly, one of the main layers that you can think about, there's a, a really strong relationship between this teaching about the burning, Aditya, and impermanence. So the idea that everything is burning, everything is on fire, it's kind of a very dramatic way of talking about impermanence, if you will. And I want to share something with you. I, I, I This kind of actually goes back it goes back to this book. So I mentioned that this was one of my first books on Buddhism. I think it was the first book on Buddhism I ever got. And like I said, I was very drawn to the fire sermon, to the sutra that we're reading. And I want to share with you, I don't think I've ever told this story. And it was a story, it was, it's a a memory that I only remembered really today when I was getting ready for class tonight. So when I first got that book and I was first studying Buddhism and I was really impressed by this fire sermon where the Buddha was talking about how everything's burning, everything's on fire. I remember I went to a park and I found a nice place to meditate and it was fall. And I remember sitting in meditation for a long time. And then I remember opening my eyes and seeing all of those beautiful fall colors, all of the reds and the oranges. But in particular, it was about all of the falling leaves. And I had such a immediate kind of insight, if you will, where I basically was like, it is all on fire. And like, there was a way in which I had a, a like, it was almost like time lapse, if you know what I mean, where I could see fall burning everything and bringing it back to the ground. And even the fall colors are so rich with reds and oranges and yellows that it was just this very direct insight about that it is all burning in that way. So again, just going back to the idea of impermanence and it, this that you can relate that idea of impermanence to the idea of the burning, you could smash those two together, the metaphor of burning and this idea of impermanence and the way that you could look at it is, is this. So let's say it doesn't matter what it is. Let's say my, well, I've got my record, so it could just as easily be my record. I think about it this way. So the Buddha is talking about this kind of dharma, this truth that all phenomena is impermanent, right? It's like everything is falling apart. Everything is in a process of decay. Nothing is going to last. So what that means, like from a Buddhist point of view, 
is that let's say I got very attached <laughs> to this record. The Buddha is saying that I am very much setting myself up for suffering because I'm getting attached to an impermanent phenomena that is guaranteed. It's guaranteed to fall apart. So you know what that could look like if you put together the sutra from tonight and the idea of impermanence? It's like, if you go to get attached to this, oh. <laughs> everything is actually on fire. Be careful. Be careful how, care how tightly you grab it in that way because you will get burned in that sense. So that is yet another kind of interesting layer to this sutta. So we've got like, you know, the fact that the Buddha is talking to a bunch of fire worshipers. So there's that layer, the impermanence layer. All, we could actually, there's a few more layers too, but I'll leave it at those. Any ideas, questions, or comments so far? Yeah, Tanya. I was thinking also what you were saying about um, uh, your interpretation of the, is it Aviraj? Um, Viraga. Viraga, Viraga, not Avi, Viraga. Um, I mean, wasn't Buddha also partially, you know, he did all the aesthetic practices of like, you know, completely pushing everything away and almost died and realized that that's just not the way to go. And that's that that sounds to me like revulsion, like re, that hmm. those aesthetic practices sound like revulsion of everything. So been there, done that, right? And that wasn't the way. So I, 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 so I so like your interpretation. Hmm. Really, I mean that hmm. really is another way that it rings true to me, as far as my understanding of you know Buddhism. I agree, and that is also. It is a, a refrain. It's a, it's a thing that goes through many sutras and it's about the middle path and the middle path between self-gratification and self-mortification. Hmm. The Buddha always describes it as that those two directions of either like just kind of working to please the self or actually working against the self in a kind of austere way where you're kind of like beating it into submission. And the Buddha said, no, 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 no. The middle path that I teach is the path between self-gratification and self-mortification. So totally, Tanya. Yeah, and then one last thing, I was also thinking about the um, about Vedana and the way that you were talking about the... Um... Viraga, though, though it's a different flavor because, as you said, it's like a stimulation, mm. um, attraction. It's like, um, but it, it seems to me if there was like a Venn diagram, there might be like a little overlap with, um, like neutral Vedana. Absolutely, and you've you've pointed that one out before, Tanya. That relationship between the three poisons, raga, dvesha, moha, attraction, aversion, and confusion, and then. These Vedana, which are either positive, negative, or neutral. And that's totally about, um, that's a good relationship to notice, Tanya. Because that's the practice is being aware of those responses we have to things in, in that way. Oh, and that little pun, maybe not quite accurate. You were on fire tonight. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help myself. <laughs> No, but, in a, but, but, but in, a, in, a, in a good way, not in a way to nope. be like flame you know, like, emojis like, all the way. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> By the way, I did want to mention one other thing about because tonight, I feel like tonight has become it's about Viraga tonight, almost like that particular idea. I want you to also know that in many instances, Viraga is a synonym, a synonym, it's synonymous with nirvana. So if you were totally viraga, that would be nirvana. And that's another, I think, important 
way to think about and understand nirvana is in the way that I was describing, which is this state of just in a way not being attracted to anything in that sense. And also, of course, not averse to anything in that way too. Noe? Uh, yes, thank you, Mario. Great talk. Yeah, uh, getting activated, <laughs> <laughs> being activated, you know, by right. something, uh, especially for me here, or, or that person walking by at the park. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, trying not to be reactive. I'm reacting. And then it's like, what am I reacting to? And then going, yeah, and there. And I can just like all of that. I pray, you know, it's a practice for sure. Indeed, Noe. And for me, as a when I kind of like kind of teach Buddhism a little more formally in that way, the practice is for me about really paying attention to raga, devesha, and moha, really paying attention to those three poisons, because Let's say I in, an, an example I use a lot is if you're driving and somebody cuts you off, there will probably be a little bit of devesha, a little bit of aversion to the event of being cut off by somebody. The practice, and I'm responding to Noe talking about practice, the practice is about noticing that I'm having an aversion to this situation. The other option is not noticing that you're having an aversion. And then you start riding the person's tail and you're like, <laughs> and the A and now what I mean is, is that the aversion has been allowed to turn into anger because we didn't notice it and we just went along with it. And so for me, knowing and understanding the three poisons and then kind of being on top of them and noticing them, that's the practice because when we notice them, they have a less likely chance of turning into tanha, craving, all of the more nasty mental states. So, yeah. All right. Unless there's any other comments. Thanks, Michelle. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Oh, Marnie. Marnie has a question. What do you got? Of course, and I maybe... sneak in last yeah. minute. Please. Okay. I um so I want to actually take it back to all because I'm thinking in my mind, um, you know, beyond, right? And that uh realization is, you know, beyond you know, gone beyond everything, right? And so all, but when I think about this all as it's described here, it almost seems like then, you know, because after we get rid of basically all or our, you know, sense and forms and everything, then we objectify basically non-objectification. And so then would that mean that self would be beyond all or could it be an analyze like that? I think I'm confusing myself, but <laughs> this, this concept of seeing that as all almost is contradicted in some of the other suttas. And yeah, maybe that's why I'm confused. Care to comment? <laughs> I see a smile. I I would love to comment. It's a very big question for right at the end, which is totally fine. So some of this may need to wait till next week. So let me put it another way, Marnie, and, and tell me if this helps. The When the Buddha is saying, or to me, how I understand it is when the Buddha is talking about the all, and the all is eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, brain, sight, sound, scent, touch, touch, and a thought, and then the six consciousnesses. And those are these 18 realms. 
And he's saying, yeah, that's it. What he seems to be asserting is that there isn't, on top of all of that, a self. There's eyes, there's ears, there's nose, there's tongue, there's a body, there's a brain, but there's not an extra dollop, an extra little dollop of a self. That's the teaching, that's the, the kind of the main teaching, this idea of no self. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, brain, visible sights, sounds, scents, flavors, that there's all of that. But this self, it's a dharma in the sense of a mental phenomena. It's an idea being entertained by brain, but it is not there actually in that way. A lot of other Indian traditions were teaching that, yeah, there's the physical world of like sights and sounds and bodies and form. And then there's like the true self on top of that. And the teaching of the all, the Buddha is saying, nope, it's just the sensory realm, and then that's it. So, Marnie, I don't know if that addressed exactly your question. Well, it kind of did. I think that, you know, I have a lot more questions than answers, but that's basically what Dharma does to me. But even with that said, let's take sight, for instance. If you show, let's say, a seven-year-old right now that record, they are not going to have the same thought process of that form that I am so ourselves are going to differ in that and so is does that mean that's part of self do you see like that's where I say we could we could go on with this and we don't have to because it is the end of the night but it it's an interesting concept and it's got me thinking that's good <laughs> it's uh, your 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 line of inquiry Marnie is spot on. Like these are great questions to be asking. I really, really encourage it. It is late, so I am going to pause there, but definitely this is not the end of the discussion, not at all. So thank you, Marnie, for, the, for those great questions. Again, we'll get to them at some point. Otherwise, I am going to call it a uh, night. And so that's going to do it for me. I'll be here next week and we're going to keep going. I'm not quite sure where we're going to go from here. So stay tuned. Marnie's question has already got me thinking about potential sutras. So, so stay tuned for that. And I'll see you all next week, if not sooner. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Marnie. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank nice you, pleasure. Michael. Thanks. Excellent. Nice. Good night, everyone. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a beautiful night. See you next time.